did seem to be me this morning. Uh, a couple of things about our service. We are uh, going to have the anniversary of baptism this morning, which takes place at the first part of the worship service. And it's a good time for all of us to uh, renew our baptism at the same time. Uh, our gospel lesson is Luke, uh, Jesus in Luke, the disciples come to Jesus and say, uh, give us more faith. And Jesus tells them about a mustard seed faith, what that would do. And he suggests that they already have enough faith. Let's uh, begin our worship through our entrance him. Please rise. I invite everyone who is celebrating the anniversary of their baptism to come forward with your parents, or at least a parent, or a primary caregiver. When God claimed these beloved young people in holy baptism, we made sacred promises. Parents promised. And parents, if you have a bulletin, you can read your promises. So parents promised to faithfully bring our... Sponsors, godparents, and this congregation promised, and congregation, to nurture them in the Christian faith and to support them and pray for them in their new life in Christ. And now you'll have to get close enough to the baptismal font to dip your finger in the baptismal font. That you may hear good news of Christ, the word of life, Parents, dip your finger in the baptismal font. 
and say to your child, as you make a sign of the cross on their ears, receive the sign of the cross on your ears. That, that, that you may see the light of Christ illumining your way. And then receive the sign of the cross on your eyes. That you may sing the praise of Christ, the joy of the church. Receive the sign of the cross on your lips. that God may dwell within you by faith. Receive the sign of the cross on your heart. That you may bear the gentle yoke of Christ in serving. Receive the sign of the cross on your shoulders. That God's mercy may be known in your works. Receive the sign of the cross on your hands. That you may follow in the way of Christ. Receive the sign of the cross on your feet. We'll uh, hand those out right after. To the, to the congregation and everyone, do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ. Who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. When you were baptized, an assisting minister gave you a candle And let's light them and hand them out. And then, these words were said by the assisting minister. Let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And the congregation says, We are proud that you are part of God's family and workers with us in the kingdom of God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the new life you give us through holy baptism. Especially, we ask you to bless each of these young people on the anniversary of their baptism. Continue to strengthen them with the Holy Spirit and increase in them your gifts of grace, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And now, Almighty God, who gives us a new birth by water and the Holy Spirit, and forgives us all our sins. Strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Share God's peace by greeting those around you. Peace. Michaela, peace. The Lord be with you. Benevolent, merciful God, when we are empty, fill us. When we are weak in faith, strengthen us. When we are cold in love, warm us, that with fervor we may love our neighbors and serve them for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated.
The first reading is from, from the first chapter and second chapters of Habakkuk. The oracle that the prophet Habakkuk saw, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not listen, or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see wrongdoing and look at trouble? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law becomes slack and justice never prevails. The wicked surround the righteous. Therefore judgment comes forth perverted. I will stand at my watch post and station myself on the rampart. I will keep watch to see what he will say to me and what he will answer concerning my complaint. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so that a runner may read it. For there is still a vision for the appointed time. It speaks of the end and does not lie. If it seems to tarry, wait for it. It will surely come, it will not delay. Look at the proud, their spirit is not right in them but the righteous live by their faith. The word of the Lord. Timothy chapter 6. Of course, there is great gain in godliness combined with contentment, for we brought nothing into the world so that we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. But as for you, man of God, shun all this, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness, fight the good fight of the faith, Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and for which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession. I charge you to keep the commandment without spot or blame until the manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ 
which he will bring about at the right time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings, Lord of lords, it is he alone who has immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. As for those who in the present age are rich, command them not to be haughty or set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of the life that really is life. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 17th chapter. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. The Lord replied, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Who among you would say to your slave who has just come in from plowing or tending sheep in the field, come here at once and take your place at the table? Would you not rather say to him, prepare supper for me, put on your apron and serve me while I eat and drink, later you may eat and drink? Do you thank the slave for doing what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were ordered to do, say, we are worthless slaves. We have done only what we ought to have done. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. I'd like to invite the children to come up. Good morning. Can anybody tell me what that is? Mustard. How many of you like mustard? Not me. <laughs> yeah. You know, I did not like mustard when I was your age. I preferred ketchup as a condiment. But as I, the older I get, the more and more I like mustard. This is yellow mustard. Guess where this is made? Mustard. <laughs> it's in a mustard factory, I guess we could say, right here in Springfield, Missouri. Yes, Carter. Is it made out of corn? No. I'm glad you asked. It's made out of mustard seed. See how tiny these are? Pretty tiny. And Jesus says, if your faith was that, if you just had faith that size, that tiny, you would be able to say to a mulberry tree, jump in the sea or go jump in the lake. And it would do it. You know, I'm sure your parents might have this in the cupboard, so go home and enjoy it. Okay. But Jesus says, you do have that much faith. It doesn't take a lot of faith. It only takes us acting on our faith and using our faith and doing faithful things. Okay? So the good news is, Jesus isn't scolding us. He's saying, you already have enough faith. And I think that's nice. All we have to do is Yes, I'm going to use my faith. 
Yeah, don't squirt that. <laughs> Let us pray. Repeat after me. Gracious God, we thank you for love. We thank you for faith. Help us to use it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. By the way, uh, we were supposed to have Bible distribution today, but I was told that everyone is going to be at the second service, so we're going to do it then. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Remember, we're starting our Simply Living uh, Stewardship uh, today, we're going to, so we're going to talk about stewardship, and today we're going to talk about the basis of why we give? Do we give to a, a budget? I, I imagine some people do, but all the experts say, no, 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 that's not why we give. We give because God calls us to give. That's just what Christians do. So simple living, our true treasure. The disciples ask Jesus to increase their faith he told them, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, and we think of that as a negative, but in Greek he's saying, and you have that. Then you would be able to tell a tree to jump in the sea. So he's not condemning the disciples. He's saying, you already have enough faith. They went to the right person to ask for faith, because Martin Luther, if you remember, tells us in the small catechism, I believe that I cannot, through my own effort, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. But the Holy Spirit calls me through the gospel and enlightens me with his gifts. So, it is a gift from God, our faith. You might think, I worked hard to believe, the Holy Spirit worked harder. So uh, we're going to look at uh, that reading from Timothy. And uh, it's, the Apostle Paul says things about riches that would really require us to have our faith in gear, a strong faith. Because our riches, we often don't realize it, how powerful the draw is of riches and wealth, how much power that has over our lives. Oh, we already had this read to us, so I'm going to skip it th through. The Apostle Paul says, those who want to be rich, they're going to have trouble church throughout the ages has looked at greed. Of course, it's considered one of the deadly sins. But what's the problem with riches and greed? We often don't recognize it in ourselves. We recognize it in other people. And by the way, nobody wants to hear a sermon on greed or riches, do we? We certainly don't want the church begging for money. But unfortunately, uh, riches have a, an incredible power over us. Back in 1635, I think I put this a little bit later in my sermon, but in 1635, a gentleman by the name of Robert Kane, he was a businessman. He was a Congregationalist. They tend to be a little bit more legalistic than us. 
and he lived in Boston, 1635. He was brought up on charges at his church, disciplined by his church, for being greedy. How did they determine that he was greedy? Well, the church elders had already determined that the most you could profit from the sale of your goods as a business person was 4%. And Cain, Robert Cain, was charging 6%. I don't know how they found that out. Charging 6%. He's got to be guilty of greed. You see, greed is something we often don't recognize in ourselves. That's why Jesus said, watch out for greed. And when he said that, he gave a little illustration for the eye is the light of the body but if the light is if the eye is dark suggesting that greed darkens our eyes so we can't truly see and we don't often see greed in ourselves there are some sins you you absolutely positively know you commit for instance, adultery, you can't say, oh, excuse me, I didn't know that wasn't my wife, right? But greed, we don't recognize it. So the church gave, uh, that church, that congregational church, said only 4%. I wonder what they'd say about the maker of the EpiPen, you know, when they sold it and it went up 400%. Other examples we could use. The Apostle Paul says those who want to be rich are going to have troubles in this life. And then he lists them. Temptation. Harmful and senseless desires. Lost faith. Pierced with many pains. And we might go, Yes, I know, but I'd sure like to try being rich anyway, right? Dorothy Sayers gave a wonderful illustration. Dorothy Sayers is, a, uh, is from Great Britain. And she wrote this. The habit of thinking about work. She says, even our work, we think about how much money I'm going to make. The habit of thinking about work is what one does to make money and to get a position in society is so ingrained in us that we can scarcely imagine what it would be like to think otherwise. People become doctors not to relieve suffering. Of course, she's generalizing here. Not all people, not all doctors are this way. People become doctors not to relieve suffering, but as a way to bring oneself and one's family up in the world. People become lawyers not to bring justice but as a way to bring oneself up in the world. And then she said this, which I find quite remarkable. During World War II, one of the biggest surprises that we had coming was that for the first time in our lives, we found ourselves happy. Now, isn't that incredible? Great Britain in World War II had bombing after bombing after bombing. And Dorothy Sayers says, for the first time in our lives, we found ourselves happy. Why? For the first time in our lives, we found ourselves doing something not for the pay, because it was miserable, not for the social standing. Now, this is important. Because all classes were thrown together. But, for the sake of working together to get something done that benefited everyone. In a small way, she says, we began to experience shalom, God's peace, peace in the midst of war, because we are all working together for something that benefited the common good. We call that mission. Jesus had one focus in his life.
to proclaim, to build, to reveal the kingdom of God. Christians, that should be our aim in life, to proclaim, to build, to reveal in word and deed the kingdom of God. That's the life. As Timothy, or Paul put it to Timothy, that really is life. Barbara Elliott tries to do this in her personal life. She tries to look at everything as some way of bringing God's order and goodness into the world. So when she combs her hair in the morning, she sees that as an expression of creation. Remember in Genesis 1, God brought creation, order, out of chaos. She saw her hair as chaos in the morning, and she's bringing the order of creation. So everything she tried to define in some biblical or spiritual manner in her life. We as a congregation developed a mission statement to say, we're about God's mission. Together, we're doing something to bring the kingdom of God into this world. And here it is. Welcome all to worship. Make disciples all the way down. As for those, Timothy, or Paul writes to Timothy, who in the present age are rich, command them not to be haughty or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Ran into a second career pastor. That's a new phenomena in our church, that second career pastors uh, in some seminaries make up 50% of those becoming pastors. And uh, so I was talking to this second career pastor, and I said, uh, why the ministry? Why a second career? He said, I was called into the ministry when I was in college. And when I graduated, I told my parents, I'm going to seminary. And they said, oh, my, well, that's a, a lofty goal. But uh, let's give you some tips first. We think, rather than just rush off to seminary, you need to get your master's degree, your master's in business administration. And then you need security. You need some money before you can possibly become a pastor. We want you to work for a while. Build up a little nest egg so you'd be secure. And it didn't take him too much convincing. He says, sure, I'll do that. And he said, I graduated with my master's degree. I made a very good income. But I never had enough money. Never had enough money. Until the re recession hit, and then my company came to me and said, you're 50, you're expendable. And they said they replaced me with someone almost 20 years younger than me. I couldn't get another job doing what I was doing. But for the first time, he said, I was free. It didn't matter how much money I had or didn't have. I went to seminary. And I said, uh, here I am today. And it's serving a little church. I said, well, how's that going? And he said, it's the best thing. The best thing that ever happened to me. Now that's a story about a pastor. We're not all pastors. Jesus was the son of a carpenter. If you look at Scripture, God Almighty puts a stamp of approval on all vocations, especially when we have the mindset as Christians, as followers of Jesus, those who are exercising their faith, that my career is there to benefit others. My uh, brother-in-law, when he took over 
the family business. He uh, claimed he never made any money, and that could very well be true. So I asked him why you're in business. And he said, I've been doing a lot of soul searching about that. I'm in business to keep my employees employed. I thought that was interesting. Uh, my brother-in-law doesn't have a whole lot of redeeming qualities, but that was one. You see? He saw his job as building the, the kingdom of God. Hope he doesn't listen to the sermon on the internet. <laughs> uh, that pastor made an interesting statement. I didn't realize how much money had seized my life until I lost it. So the Apostle Paul tells us the rich are to be good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation, a good foundation for the future, so they may take hold of the life that really is life. Giving, oh, Pastor Dan, it hurts so much. Giving is supposed to hurt. You see, when we're trying to gain so much, everything costs us. In a sense, we die to get it. We work so hard. But what Jesus gives us, he gives us the kingdom. And who dies to do that? Jesus dies to give us the kingdom. So our true treasure, our true treasure is in Christ our Lord. Amen.
Rejoicing in the Spirit's work among us, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Like the disciples, we pray that you increase the face of your church, O God. Raise up faithful parents and grandparents, prophets and teachers, who know, love, and spread your gospel. Lord, in your mercy. Save the nations, O God. Raise up faithful leaders who strive for peace and justice in the midst of the violence and destruction in this world. Especially, we are thankful for Rami Adham, a Finnish Syrian father of six who takes toys and medicine and food to the besieged in Syria. And Dr. Ashkwa Marharam, who has used her own resources to provide food and medical aid to starving residents of Yemen. And to Josh Combs, a hairdresser, who has offered free services to the homeless and has inspired others to follow his example. Lord, we ask that you send your peace. Lord, in your mercy. Guard those in need, O God. Send your healing to those who are sick or undergoing treatment, especially we pray for. Jamie Alexander, Maddie Bobrink, Bryce Bauer, Carolyn Callen, Doris Embertson, Sophia Fedgley, Dennis Holmes, Janet Littlecrow, Andrew Stephen Malcolm, Chris Marquardt, Jan Snath, Sean Snellen, Chris Snyder, Lucy Stillwell, Paul Thompson, Bennett Wilkerson, and Kathy Zinter. Are there any others? You abolished death, O God. Thank you for all those you called according to your purpose and who now rest in your light. Comfort those who mourn, especially the family and friends of Dennis Chapel and of John Albrecht. Lord, in your mercy. Give vision to this congregation, O God. Raise up faithful teachers, staff, volunteers, worship leaders, and council members who serve with purpose, joy, boldness, and love. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus, through your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Rex Johnson is going to give us a table talk. Good morning. I'm a member of the uh, Finance Committee, and uh, it's a really good group. We're led by Brian Wogan, who is a real asset to this church. We've done a lot of good things these past four or five years. We had some deficits. We had some funds that weren't fully funded. But right now, all, of, all the uh, restricted fund accounts are, are fully funded, and we're really in pretty good shape in that sense. We uh, also made a $100,000 payment principal payment on our building loan this last year, so, so that's a real positive thing. One thing about the Finance Committee, we don't, we don't address ministry and mission. Our job is to look at the funds that come in, how they're spent, and how it relates to the budget, and how expenses are handled. We've done some good things, and if you look at the spirit every month, you'll see that you know income coming in, expenses going out. So far this year, it looks like We've done all right because we've always had a positive balance. That's a little deceiving. In uh, our annual meeting, we budgeted $50,000 for new hires for this year. And the thinking was that sometime during this year, we would hire some people, part-time, full-time, whatever it was, and we budgeted $50,000 for that. If we'd hired somebody this year, our cost up through August, would it, we would have budgeted $34,000. To date, we had a surplus of around $21,000. So if we'd hired people, we'd been $13,000 short already. We haven't hired anyone yet, but you saw in the messenger this morning that we posted a job for a part-time position for a family and youth ministry person. That's a good thing. But our $21,000 surplus that we built up 
so far this year is really not $21,000. There's some other things that have happened. Daycare, which has been a mission for uh, Lighthouse Daycare, is, has uh, been a ministry of ours for a number of years. It's been a good ministry, but right now, year to date, we're down $11,000, almost $12,000 in, in that ministry. So our $21,000, take $12,000 off, we've got a $10,000 surplus. So the, the point is, if we'd hired people that we thought we'd hire, and when we hire somebody, we have a commitment to them. We can't hire people if we can't pay them. So if we think we really need the people, we need to have the funds to do it. So the last quarter of the year, stewardship is starting. Uh, let's all make an extra effort to try to build up and follow through on our pledges. Our pledging is down. We're receiving about 85% of what was pledged. Then, you know, 85% is a pretty high figure if you're grading on, uh, if you're going to school. But 15% of our budget, that's like $6,000 a month that we're under. We've watched our expenses. We're, we're, we're uh, doing okay. But if we want to go forward, if we want to hire some additional staff, if we want to do the things that we want to do, we need to meet our budget this year, make a real commitment for next year, and uh, make 2017 a great year for Messiah. Thank you, Rex. Thank you, Bruce. Let us pray, merciful God. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you. O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord.
In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All is ready. Our Lord invites us. Please come. You may be seated.
the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. We come again to you, O God, giving you thanks that in this feast of mercy you have embraced us and healed us, making us one in the body of Christ. Go with us on our way, equip us for every good work, that we may continue to give you thanks by embracing others with mercy and healing. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Right after the service, there is a breakfast. It's... Carl, go ahead. Okay. One quick note here. The past couple of Sundays, my wife Lisa and I have been encouraging all of us wearing our name tags. And it's been a real good response from many people. I did not have a name tag to sign the list, and we get one for you. But as a church community, it's so important for all of us to get to know each other. Many of you have been members here for several years, and you know everyone, but you don't know a lot of the new people. We've been here about a year and a half, and we've learned some new names. Talked to one gentleman this morning and said he's been here for years. He's met some new people. So we're not going to have the table out there anymore except for a notepad to request a name tag if you don't have one. But please, every Sunday, let's wear a name tag so we get to know each other better. Thank you, Carl. I have two announcements, uh, one while the camp, some of the camp kids can come up. Um, the first one is, if anyone is interested in being a substitute Sunday school teacher for any age or even helping out, we have several classes that only have one teacher right now, and we try to have two teachers so that we can team teach, or if someone can't be there, the kids already know someone. So if you are interested, you can contact myself or Julie Burnell, and we would be happy to help or have you um, be part of that. And the reason why I have a couple of camp kids up here today is um, out in the narthex we have a thing quarters for camp camp tomashinga is asking for campers during the month of october to be able to for congregations to raise money for maintenance and things like that and upkeep of the camp so the money would go directly to camp tomashinga to help keep things nice and the betterment of the camp overall so help out by saving your quarters or any change and we'll get that make sure that that gets to tomashinga you caught me on a day when I had quarters in my pocket. Next weekend is our church camp out at Indian Point on Table Rock Lake. We've got, I think, about 41 people signed up. We've got room for more. If you don't have a tent, don't worry. I think we could find you one. If you have a motorhome, pop-up, trailer, whatever, there are electric sites down there. For the people that have signed up, if you have not received an email from me, come see me out here and I'll tell you a couple details. I thank everybody, but a couple have responded. Very good. Then, um, pastor's class, it, we will meet in the where we always meet, the adult education class that has been working with the book about uh, um, attitudes within the church will be in the choir practice room. Also, at, and they'll meet at 10. Trunk or treat, sign up in the back. I think that's it. Please receive this benediction. 
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Guided by the gospel, we come all to worship, make disciples, hunger for ministry, nurture youth, gather resources for growing ministries, offer healing and care to all our need. Go in peace, remember the poor. Yeah.